Due to the graphic nature of this program, viewer discretion is advised. Sharpsburg is a small town in the central panhandle of Maryland. It would otherwise be known as a quiet, innocuous town had it not been for one of the deadliest days in American history. In 1862, the Confederate Army marched into Sharpsburg and engaged Union forces in the bloodiest single day of the entire Civil War. Now, the town is haunted by the events of that fateful day, and it's said that the ghosts of some of the soldiers who lost their lives there still linger behind. Bloody Lane's Phantom Soldiers Bloody Lane, a sunken road where thousands of soldiers met their end, is the epicenter of spectral activity. Visitors report hearing phantom gunfire, cries of anguish, and orders barked by unseen commanders. Some have even seen ghostly figures in tattered uniforms marching silently along the path, their faces etched with agony. Burnside Bridge Apparitions The stone bridge where soldiers fought valiantly to cross Antietam Creek is a hotspot for apparitions. Witnesses describe seeing ghostly figures patrolling the area or hearing splashing footsteps in the water, even on calm days. The distinct smell of gunpowder often lingers in the air, adding to the eerie atmosphere. She sat there at the foot of the undisturbed bed. The empty room was exactly as he left it, but the atmosphere was different. The furniture seemed foreign now that the person who had lived there was gone. A chair at a desk suddenly looked so empty as if it had never been sat in. The bed where she used to tuck in her little boy now seemed so unfamiliar as if it had never been slept in. The deep lines in her face illustrated her despair, which was punctuated by a frown that looked as if it were carved from wood. In her hand was a crinkled piece of paper, clutched so tightly that the knuckles turned white and trembled. The words on the paper cut through her like a razor. I feel how weak and fruitless must be any words of mine which should attempt to beguile you from the grief of a loss so overwhelming. The letter had arrived less than an hour ago, and she knew what it said before she opened it. A mother's intuition, although a mother she was no more. Robbed of the one thing that made her who she was. The only thing in her life that she considered to be of intrinsic value. Gone. Ripped away. Her only son. A free-spirited young man at the age of 22, lying dead in a cornfield in Maryland among thousands of his brothers in arms. And the words on this paper were supposed to ease the pain. I pray that our Heavenly Father leave you only the cherished memory of the loved and lost and the solemn pride that must be yours to have laid so costly a sacrifice upon the altar of freedom. She couldn't physically squeeze the letter any tighter, so in a gesture of frustration, she threw it to the floor, where it landed softly and harmlessly in a most unsatisfying manner. Just then, she felt a small hand on her shoulder, accompanied by a small voice, saying, Don't cry, Mama. I'm with God now. She turned and saw her son, but he wasn't the man he was when he went off to fight for the Union. He was a little boy again, his skin pale and his hair waving as if in a breeze, although there was none to speak of. He looked at her with sorrowful eyes, and offered a solemn smile before his image dissolved into thin air. The thin air. The Miller Farmhouse Activity. The Miller Farmhouse, located near the infamous cornfield on the Antietam battlefield, stands as a grim reminder of the horrors of war. During the Battle of Antietam on September 17, 1862, the farmhouse and its surrounding property were used as a makeshift field hospital. Wounded soldiers were brought to the site, and many succumbed to their injuries there. Blood-soaked floors and anguished cries marked the farmhouse as a place of pain and suffering. Over time, the Miller farmhouse has gained a reputation for being one of the most haunted locations on the battlefield. 
visitors and paranormal investigators report an array of chilling phenomena. Shadowy figures are often seen moving past the windows, even when the house is unoccupied. Some witnesses describe hearing faint cries for help or the groans of dying soldiers echoing through the air. One of the most startling accounts involves the sensation of being watched. Many who visit the site claim to feel an oppressive presence, as if unseen eyes are observing their every move. Cold spots and sudden drops in temperature are frequently experienced, even on warm days. War was fought by Antietam Creek. The two armies, led by Generals George McClellan of the Union and Robert E. Lee of the Confederacy, met on September 17, 1862. Despite having many tactical advantages, General McClellan's overly cautious battle strategy led to the battle being a tactical draw, and both sides suffered mass casualties. Nearly 23,000 soldiers left the battlefield dead, wounded, or missing in what was by far the bloodiest day ever on American soil. The unprecedented loss of human life on that day has led to the area having a heavy feeling of melancholy and despair, and many visitors to the area have claimed paranormal experiences, some of which claiming to see the ghosts of the brave men who lost their lives on that fateful day. As Union soldiers stepped out onto the cornfield at dawn, September 17, 1862, Confederate troops unleashed a horrific volley. The single bloodiest day in American history had begun in earnest. For the next four hours, the cornfield was the center of a storm of lead, iron, and flame, as Federal soldiers from the 1st and 12th Corps clashed with Lee's men. The cornfield changed hands again and again as both sides attacked and counterattacked. One soldier remembered, the air seems full of leaden missiles. Rifles are shot to pieces in the hands of soldiers. Canteens and haversacks are riddled with bullets, and the dead and wounded go down in scores. More than 25,000 soldiers fought in and around the cornfield. By 9.30 in the morning, thousands of them lay dead and dying. Confederate General John Bell Hood wrote, It was here that I witnessed the most terrible clash of arms by far that has occurred during the war. Union General Joseph Hooker remembered that every stalk of corn in the northern and greater part of the field was cut as closely as could have been done with a knife, and the slain lay in rows precisely as they stood in their ranks a few moments before. It was never my fortune to witness a more bloody, dismal battlefield. Recently, a class of boys from a private school took a field trip to the Antietam battlefield, and they experienced something strange. The teacher, a Civil War expert, was perplexed by the boys' claim of hearing the chanting of a phantom Christmas carol when they were near the watchtower at Bloody Lane. The teacher asked what Christmas carol exactly, and the boys said it was Deck the Halls, specifically the fa la la la, -la part. The teacher's confusion turned to shock when he pieced together exactly what they were hearing. Bloody Lane is probably the most infamous site of the Antietam battlefield. An estimated 5,500 men were killed or wounded in a three-and-a-half-hour midday battle for Sunken Farm Road. It's a place known for courage, bravery, suffering, and death. Today, the dirt path with high banks is flanked by split-rail fences and a few mounted markers. The banks are three to six feet higher than the dirt lane. The road was defended by 2,200 Confederates from Alabama and North Carolina under General D.H. Hill, who held off approaching Union troops for nearly four hours. It was a heavyweight shootout at close range. The Union approach was 700 yards wide, and many troops were in combat for the first time. The Confederates had a strong defensive position in and around the sunken road. Union reinforcements arrived, including the Irish Brigade from 69th New York Infantry, which lost 62% of its men in the attack. This brigade of Irishmen were volunteers who enlisted to fight for their adopted country in hopes to learn some battlefield skill to use later to liberate their own homeland. That day at Antietam, they were called on to make a frontal assault on a strongly held sunken road bordered by a stout wooden fence. It was a naturally strong and defensive position fronting on an open field. 
It was over this open country, without any protection and any support, that the men of the Irish Brigade were called on to attack. They charged forward, chanting a Gaelic battle cry, Fa Abala, meaning clear the way, across an open field towards their enemies, hidden in the sunken road behind a zigzagging fence. They suffered terrible losses, and although the charge was unsuccessful, it gave other Federal units enough time to flank the Confederate position. Today, Bloody Lane is said to be haunted by the many soldiers who died there. Phantom gunshots, accompanied by the smell of gunpowder, have been reported despite no actual gunfire occurring. Several visitors to the battlefield have claimed to see groups of men in Confederate uniforms, assuming they were reenactors, only to have them vanish into thin air. Most famously, however, are the reports of phantom Gaelic chanting from the ghosts of the 69th New York Brigade of Irishmen. Burnside Bridge was the spot of another bloody encounter during the battle. Union troops tried to force a crossing over Antietam Creek at the bridge and paid dearly for it. The troops could have easily forded the stream, but for some reason, General Burnside insisted on taking the bridge. The troops tried to funnel onto the bridge, but were mowed down by Confederate gunfire as they bottlenecked towards the entrance. Since then, there have been numerous visitors who have given eyewitness accounts of paranormal encounters. Many reports seeing ghostly figures, others seeing strange blue balls of light, and still more have heard the sounds of a phantom drummer and other battle sounds there. The House's Phantoms, the Piper House, a stately yet solemn structure on the Antietam battlefield, played a critical role during the harrowing events of September 17, 1862. Owned by Henry and Elizabeth Piper, this farmhouse was situated near the Confederate defensive line and quickly became a focal point of the battle. After the fighting subsided, the home served as a makeshift field hospital where injured soldiers were treated amidst chaotic and gruesome conditions. Many succumbed to their wounds within its walls, leaving an indelible mark on the property. Today, the Piper House is notorious for its paranormal activity, often described as ghostly residue left behind by the soldiers and caretakers who experienced unimaginable horrors. Visitors and historians alike report unsettling phenomena, including doors that open and close unassisted, as if unseen hands are still tending to battlefield tasks. Quaint weeping and murmured prayers are commonly heard, particularly in the late evening hours. Those who venture inside describe an unshakable feeling of sadness and dread, as though the despair of the dying lingers in the very fabric of the house. Cold spots and inexplicable drafts have been noted even in sealed rooms. Some claim to see fleeting apparitions of soldiers moving through the hallways or sitting silently near windows. The Piper House stands as a stark reminder of the human cost of war, its haunted atmosphere preserving the echoes of those who pass through in their final, anguished moments. Cornfield Shadows The cornfield at Antietam, a seemingly ordinary stretch of farmland, became a site of unimaginable carnage during the Battle of Antietam on September 17, 1862, this area saw some of the most brutal fighting of the day, with thousands of soldiers clashing in the dense rows of cornstalks. By the end of the battle, the ground was soaked with blood, and the cornfield became a harrowing symbol of the war's devastation. Today, the cornfield is notorious for its paranormal activity, earning its reputation as one of the battlefield's most haunted locations. Visitors often report seeing shadowy figures darting between the stalks, resembling soldiers moving in formation. These fleeting apparitions are frequently accompanied by the sound of gunfire, shouts, and the metallic clash of bayonets, phantom echoes of the battle that still linger. Many have described an overwhelming sense of unease while walking through the cornfield. The air is often heavy, and some visitors claim to feel unseen presences brushing past them, as if residual energy from the soldiers remains tied to the land. On quiet nights, faint whispers and prayers can be heard, as though the spirits of the fallen are still seeking solace. Photographs taken in the cornfield often reveal anomalies, including orbs, misty shapes, 
and even shadowy outlines resembling human figures. These chilling experiences make the cornfield a magnet for paranormal enthusiasts and a somber reminder of the battle's horrific toll. Roulette Farm's Haunting Echoes The Roulette Farm, a serene property turned somber during the Battle of Antietam, bore witness to some of the most tragic events of the conflict. Owned by William and Margaret Roulette, the farm became a staging ground and field hospital during the battle. The barn, in particular, housed countless wounded soldiers, many of whom succumbed to their injuries amidst the chaos and rudimentary medical care of the time. The surrounding fields, once fertile and green, were left littered with the fallen. Today, the roulette farm is infamous for its paranormal phenomena, often referred to as haunting echoes of its bloody past. Visitors and historians alike have reported hearing disembodied voices and footsteps in and around the barn. These sounds, described as heavy boots pacing back and forth, evoke the memory of soldiers awaiting treatment or their fate. Inside the barn, cold spots and an inexplicable sense of dread are frequently experienced even on warm summer days. Some have seen shadowy figures lurking in the dim corners of the structure, disappearing when approached. The most chilling reports come from individuals who claim to hear faint groans and cries of pain, as though the spirits of the injured are still trapped in their final moments. Even the farmhouse itself is said to hold lingering energy, with doors that creak open on their own, and the faint scent of blood or antiseptic wafting through the air. The roulette farm remains a poignant haunted reminder of the sacrifices endured during the battle. The location of the Dunker Church on the Antietam battlefield made it an important landmark because it was high on the ground in the center of the Confederate line. The Dunker Church was a visual reference point for both Confederates and Federals during the Battle of Antietam because its distinctive whitewashed walls stood out well in the geographical center of the battlefield. It was a foggy, rainy morning, and the smoke from the battle made it hard to identify the landmarks. Thomas Stonewall Jackson's men were encamped behind the Dunker Church and along the Confederate line north and south of the church. Being at the center of the battle, the church was surrounded by violent death for the entire day. During and after the battle, it was used as a field hospital, and for a time, was the scene of a ghastly mass of the wounded and dying. Soldiers' limbs were hacked off by the score, without anesthesia, and many were the men who died in agony there. Many visitors to the church have claimed to see phantom soldiers appearing and disappearing. Others have reported hearing the disembodied screams of dying men, and there are phantom bloodstains on the floorboards that will appear and disappear at random. The Dunker Church's Ethereal Congregation The Dunker Church, a small white structure on the Antietam battlefield, was a focal point during the bloodiest single-day battle in American history. Originally a place of peace and worship for the pacifist German Baptist Brethren, it became a site of horrific violence. On September 17, 1862, located near the West Woods, the church stood at the center of intense fighting and the ground around it was soaked with the blood of thousands of soldiers. The building later served as a grim refuge for the wounded and dying. What day? The Dunker Church is not only a historical landmark, but also a site of profound paranormal activity. Known for its ethereal congregation, the church draws reports of ghostly hymns and prayers, often heard late at night or during the early morning hours. Witnesses have described the soft murmur of voices in unison, as though a spectral congregation gathers in worship. Inside the church, visitors have reported sudden chills and the sensation of unseen presences as if spirits still linger in the space they once considered sacred. Ghostly lights, resembling flickering candles, have been seen through the windows when the building is empty. The most startling accounts involve fleeting apparitions, shadowy figures dressed in 19th century attire, seated in pews or standing in prayer. The Dunker Church's haunting activity serves as a poignant reminder of the clash between its original purpose of peace and the violence it witnessed, leaving an indelible mark on both its history and its spirit. The Ghost Rider of Antietam Creek Among the many chilling legends of the Antietam battlefield, the tale of the Ghost Rider of Antietam Creek stands out for its eerie 
and enigmatic nature. This spectral figure is said to be the restless spirit of a Confederate cavalryman who perished near the creek during the intense fighting on September 17, 1862. Antietam Creek, a strategic waterway during the battle, became a scene of chaos and bloodshed, with soldiers falling to their deaths on its banks. Accounts of the Ghost Rider date back to the late 19th century and continue to this day. Witnesses often describe a lone rider clad in Confederate grey, galloping silently along the creek's edge. The ghostly figure appears to be searching for something or someone lost in the fog of war. What makes the apparition particularly unsettling is its ability to vanish abruptly, leaving no trace of horse or rider. Visitors to the area frequently report hearing the distant sound of hoofbeats, even when no horses are present. On misty nights, the rider has been seen emerging from the fog, only to dissolve into the shadows moments later. Paranormal investigators have attempted to capture evidence of the rider, but the elusive spirit remains a mystery. The ghost rider of Antietam Creek is a haunting symbol of the battle's enduring sorrow. Whether a lingering soldier or a residual echo of the past, the rider continues to inspire both fear and fascination among those who explore this historic and haunted site. 1976, the Pry House. The night sky glowed orange as the flames raging from the blown out windows licked the night air, transforming the black sky to a vibrant shade of purple. Sergeant McDonough and his team were first on the scene and he instructed his firefighters to hook up the hoses. Smoke was billowing out from beneath the roofing shingles, suggesting that the fire had reached all levels of the house. We need to clear the house to make sure nobody's inside, he barked at his team. McDonough and three other firefighters approached the front door and attempted to open it, but it was stuck shut. They broke out the axes and chopped their way in. They could smell the smoke and burning wood through their masks, but couldn't see anything due to the thick black smoke that enveloped the entire interior of the house. As the team approached the stairs, McDonough put his hand up and shouted for them to stop. A loud creaking emanated from the ceiling as McDonough screamed to get out. The four firefighters scrambled for the front door as the second floor collapsed. Beams and chunks of plaster came crashing to the floor, but all four firefighters safely escaped the disaster. Deeming the structure too dangerous to send anyone in, the team of firefighters battled the conflagration with fire hoses from outside. A young firefighter from a neighboring town approached McDonough in a panic and pointed to the second floor window. The window was glowing orange, but no flames were coming from it. There's a woman in that room. She just walked by the window, the young man excitedly explained. McDonough focused on the window with a look of confusion. That's impossible, he explained. I was just in there. There's no floor in that room. The Pry House served as Union General George McClellan's headquarters during the September 17, 1862 Battle of Antietam. As casualties mounted on the bloodiest day in American history, the Pry Farmhouse and Barn became a field hospital. Union General Israel Richardson was gravely wounded and taken to an upstairs room of the house. He lingered near death for over a month. His wife Frances made the trip down from Michigan to help care for her husband. But with her by his side, Richardson expired in November. Both General Richardson, as well as his wife Frances, are said to haunt the Pry House. During the fire of 1976, firefighters witnessed her apparition walking past a window. Initially concerned it was a person trapped in the fire, they were shocked to realize that there was no floor in that room, and a person simply could not have been walking around in there. A few weeks later, during renovations to repair the fire damage, passersby also witnessed a woman walking around on the second floor. To their surprise, they also learned that there was still no floor and it was impossible for someone to have been walking by that window. Some visitors to the house, which is now a museum, have complained of an inexplicable feeling of panic and anxiety. Paranormal enthusiasts believe this could be the disembodied emotions of Union soldiers who occupied the house in the days leading up to the battle. 
The Battle of Antietam will forever be remembered by its sheer brutality. A tactical draw that left both armies decimated, although both sides attempted to spin it as a victory. Lee and his army were able to escape back into Virginia without being pursued, and Lincoln used the battle as the catalyst to sign the Emancipation Proclamation, sealing the fate of the Confederacy by dissuading European countries to come to their aid. The loss of life on that rainy September day was unprecedented, and the subsequent despair that followed has lingered for over 160 years. Now, the blood-soaked ground where thousands lost their lives remains haunted by the ghosts of Antietam. From the central part of Washington County, we bring you here to the eastern part. This is South Mountain. South Mountain has always played an important role in this area. Its gaps and passes were natural passageways west for the early settlers. It provided natural defense from Indian attack. But most importantly, it was the site of the first battle between Robert E. Lee's Army of Northern Virginia and George B. McClellan's Army of the Potomac in the Civil War. What's become known as the Battle of South Mountain is our focus in the next series of legends. This battle played an important role in Lee's first invasion into northern soil, but it became overshadowed by the events that took place just a few days later, the Battle of Antietam. It was only just recently that this South Mountain area became recognized as an official battlefield site. The uh, South Mountain State Battlefield was created uh, two years ago in June of 2000, uh, enacted by a bill signed by Governor Glenn Denning that created the battlefield. Uh, it is the first state-operated battlefield in the state of Maryland. All the other battlefield sites are oper operated by the National Park Service. So uh, we're pretty fortunate in the fact that uh, we finally were able to get this uh, proclaimed as an official Civil War battlefield. In this final segment, we'll bring you an update on a legend we brought you in our last Legends program and we'll take you to one of the oldest sites in Washington County. But first, we will take you to the little Frederick County town of Burkittsville. This quiet little community lies just at the base of the southern portion of South Mountain, below a break in the volcanic folds called Crampton's Gap. We travel back to September 1862, when the Civil War, for the first time, brought its horrors to northern soil. Early that month, Confederate General Robert E. Lee began to move his army northward into Maryland. Lee moved the Confederate Army of Northern Virginia to Leesburg where he gathered the various elements of his army and then will begin to cross at uh, White's Ford which is on the Potomac River and not far away from White's Ferry. They're two separate places. Uh, just to the east of Leesburg and crossing over into Maryland they will come up to Poolsville and by various routes arrive in Frederick. All of Lee's army will be crossed the Potomac River and into Frederick by the 7th of September. Lee felt that a victory on northern soil might help France and England to recognize the South as an independent state. He had also hoped that by moving into the virgin fields of Maryland, it might help relieve Virginia of supplying the Confederate army with food. He has very high hopes for this campaign, that this could be the winning campaign for the Confederate States of America. Several days after Lee crossed into Maryland, McClellan began to cautiously pursue him by moving northward from Washington. McClellan and the Army of the Potomac reached Frederick on September 13th. McClellan learned that Lee had moved out of the area just days before. Unfortunately, Lee's next move was unknown to McClellan. But while staying in Frederick, McClellan's luck changed when a Union soldier found written orders from Lee to the rest of the Army wrapped around a cigar. Part of Lee's plans assumed that once he moved into Maryland, a Union army would be forced to come out of Washington, D.C. and pursue him, that the Union government could not afford to let him wander at will through Western Maryland, which was quite correct. Special Order 191 detailed Lee's Maryland campaign. It laid out his plans to split the Army of Northern Virginia into five parts. Three parts were to march toward Harper's Ferry to put pressure on the Union garrison there, one part to travel to Hagerstown, and the last part under the command of General D.H. Hill, was ordered to stay behind at Boonesboro to guard the Army's rear. On September 14th, McClellan moved out of Frederick in pursuit of Lee. He moved his army toward the gaps of South Mountain. Early on the morning of the 14th, the Union Army found the Confederates spread along the Frederick County side of South Mountain, from Turner's Gap, where the old South Mountain Inn stands, southward to Fox's Gap. 
where we will hear about the old farmer, Daniel Wise. Finally, ending at Crampton's Gap, which becomes the basis for our first legend of South Mountain, the legend of Spook Hill. The Crying Soldier at the Mummer Cemetery, nestled near the Mummer Farm on the Antietam battlefield, the Mummer Cemetery is a small but solemn site that holds the remains of local families, including members of the Mummer family. During the Battle of Antietam, the surrounding area saw intense fighting and the nearby Mummer farmhouse was burned down by Confederate soldiers to prevent Union forces from using it as a sharpshooting post. The cemetery, though untouched by the flames, became enveloped in the chaos and bloodshed that defined the day. One day, the Mummer Cemetery is renowned for its paranormal activity. Visitors often report hearing soft sobbing and whispers, especially at twilight. These eerie sounds seem to emanate from the graves themselves, as if unseen mourners linger in eternal grief. The most commonly cited apparition is that of a weeping soldier, dressed in a tattered uniform, kneeling by one of the gravestones. Witnesses describe him as a sorrowful figure, seemingly unaware of the living, lost in a moment of mourning for comrades or loved ones. Others have experienced sudden chills, unexplainable drafts, and an overwhelming sense of sadness while walking among the graves. Some paranormal investigators have captured electronic voice phenomena, EVP, of faint cries or murmured words, adding to the cemetery's reputation as a haunted site. The battle at Crampton's Gap was meant to be the main focus of McClellan's advance on the 14th of September. He had given very positive and very uh, uh, precise orders to General Franklin, commanding the 6th Union Army Corps, to advance from his position in Jefferson, or beyond Jefferson, to take possession of Crampton's Gap, and once through the Gap, to vigorously uh, go through Pleasant Valley and rescue that Harper's Ferry garrison of 12,000 or more federal soldiers. Uh, this was to be the end run. And uh, almost from the beginning, Franklin does not move near as vigorously as McClellan had uh, encouraged or anticipated him to do. When the uh, Federal Sixth Corps arrived in Burkittsville, they got there about noon and were met by artillery fire on the uh, top of the mountain. Uh, they, they dropped back, uh, ate lunch, and took about four hours to develop an actual scheme of attack. When the attack came, it came again around about 4, 4.30 in the afternoon. As the Union 6th Corps approached Burkittsville, uh, the Confederate guns will begin to fire at long range, uh, seeing this approach coming and realizing that they can slow down and attack. And uh, Franklin will order up some of his artillery to deploy and fire back, and so there is a, a substantial artillery barrage that is going to accompany this infantry assault. The uh, initial artillery position early in the morning was further down around the turn. This was part of uh, Chew's battery and then the Portsmouth Light Artillery also joined them there on that particular area. Uh, as the fighting started and it looked like the Confederate line was going to be overwhelmed, Chew and the other guns pulled out of the area. Uh, again, it wasn't until Cobb arrived with his regiment that the Troop Light Artillery, who was attached to them, came into the gap itself. Basically, they had one gun pointing down each road uh, as the Federals popped up over the hill. And they were only able to get off about five rounds, but even at that, they did so very well. And that fact wasn't missed by one of the federal officers who commended them for their bravery. Once they see that a Union attack is forming, they will send word to McClaws that they are about to be attacked and asking for reinforcements. McClaws will respond by sending a brigade of Georgians, commanded by a general by the name of uh, Cobb, to Crampton's Gap to reinforce the uh, pitifully small defenders, the uh, Virginia regiments under Parham and, and Munford's uh, two regiments of, of Confederate cavalry. Uh, but Cobb's Georgians will arrive practically simultaneously with the Union assault. Federal Sixth Corps, of course, at that time had about 12,000 men in them. Uh, unbeknownst to them, though, behind a stone wall along what's called Mountain Church Road today was only about 1,000 Confederate soldiers. When the Union soldiers close in on the Confederates along the stone wall at Mountain Church Road, the order of charge is given. As this federal advance begins, as the charge is made and the Virginians at the wall begin to give way, uh, there will be an attempt to get the artillery pieces out of there, that they will bring up their horse teams, attach their cannons to the limbers, which the horses pull, and of course retreat back over the hill. 
but they will try to make a fighting retreat of it, pausing a couple of times to fire. Uh, some of Cobb's uh, artillery guns will be captured. He had brought up a battery with him, and uh, that uh, battery will lose two guns in this fight. So once the Federals' push uh, started in earnest, the, the, the story was foretold. Uh, sheer weight of numbers again drove the Confederates from behind the stone wall, pushed them up through the gap. And so the Federals will be driving up uh, the two roads that intersect at the top of Crampton's Gap at where the correspondence arch is now, and in between the two, and driving back the Confederate defenders as they uh, uh, do so. And of course, it is simply a matter of numbers, and uh, uh, the Confederates would be forced to yield with severe losses. Confederates tried one last stand in the pass itself, again along another stone wall. Two guns of the troop light artillery were brought up and fired canister right into the faces of the Federal soldiers as they were popping up over the ridge. Uh, this staggered the Federals for a moment, but again, sheer weight of numbers told the tale, and they were quickly overwhelmed and were forced to draw off the top of the mountain down into the uh, valley beyond. Franklin's troops, too exhausted to pursue, come up the road and spend the night in the gap and along these mountain roads. It is the Confederate withdrawal up and into Crampton's Gap that serves as the basis for our first South Mountain legend. The legend of Spook Hill tells the story of the Confederate artillerymen who valiantly tried to save their guns during the Union charge up the mountainside. As the Union soldiers charged towards them, the Confederate soldiers manning the guns tried desperately to push their cannons up the side of the mountain. But as the Confederates pushed the guns upward, they were either shot or had to abandon the guns to save their own lives. This caused the cannons to roll back down the hill, killing the other Confederate soldiers who were also fleeing for their lives below. It is believed by local residents that these poor Confederate souls never left the battlefield that day. Today, the area is quiet. The sounds of cannons aren't even a memory anymore. The entire area shows virtually no signs of the Battle of South Mountain, except for an occasional sign along the road. But there is one spot along the Gapland Road that may still hold the memories of the actions that took place that afternoon. It is said that if you stop your car at a certain spot along Gaplin Road next to the battlefield, place it in neutral, you'll begin to drift uphill. People speculate that it's those Confederate soldiers that are pushing vehicles back up the mountain. They are forever charged with the task of pushing the cannons back up the mountain to Crampton's Gap and away from the advancing Federals. Some say the legend isn't true, that the portion of Gaplin Road is just an optical illusion. They claim that the road in fact slopes downwards, not upwards. It's just a simple trick of optics but some tell an entirely different legend altogether. The legend that I know of surrounding Burkittsville uh, was that uh, after the battle, a wagon load of wounded, evidently without horse teams attached, was left on a piece of the road which looked evidently to be level or slightly tilted in one direction, but in fact it was an optical illusion sort of thing. We're actually tilted in the other, and so when they unhitched the teams and just left the wagon sitting, it moved in a direction that appeared to many people to be rolling uphill, and that this was a phenomena that uh, many people took as some sort of uh, uh, sign. And so the legend was that uh, in modern times people would drive their automobiles to this spot and take them out of gear and, and release emergency brake and the car would likewise appear to roll uphill and people began to make some sort of uh, conclusion that this had something to do with the spiritual world and not uh, physics. The, uh, the legend as I heard it was that uh, prior to the Battle of South Mountain or just as the battle was beginning, a uh, Confederate artillery group was trying to push one of their artillery pieces up the road towards the mountain to get it up on top ready for, uh, for action. When a Federal artillery shell landed on the crew killing them all instantly. Uh, the legend then is that even to today, that same group of men are trying to push that cannon to the top of the mountain, which is why you can take your car down there, put it in neutral, and it starts to roll backwards up the mountain. Is it simple physics? Does the road actually slope downhill? Maybe. Then again, yet maybe something else entirely different is happening along that stretch of Gaplin Road. The Phantom Drummer Boy among the most poignant and eerie legends of the Antietam battlefield 
is that of the phantom drummer boy. Drummer boys, often young teenagers or even children, played a crucial role in Civil War armies. They relayed orders through drum beats, setting the pace for marching troops and signaling commands in the chaos of battle. Many of these boys faced the same dangers as the soldiers, and some tragically lost their lives on the battlefield. The phantom drummer boy of Antietam is said to be the spirit of one such young soldier who perished during the brutal fighting on September 17, 1862. Witnesses report hearing the faint rhythmic sound of drumming late at night, often near the cornfield or along Bloody Lane. The drumming, described as slow and mournful, seems to echo through the air without a visible source. Occasionally, visitors claim to see the apparition of a boy in a tattered Union uniform, clutching a drum as he marches solemnly along the battlefield trails. The boy appears unaware of the living, his expression somber and focused, as though he remains forever bound to his duty. Paranormal investigators have captured audio recordings of unexplained drumming and have noted temperature drops in areas associated with the legend. For many, the phantom drummer boy symbolizes the innocence lost in the brutality of war, his spectral presence a haunting reminder of the young lives forever marked by the conflict at Antietam. In our last Legends program, we brought you the story of an old farmer who lived here at Fox's Gap by the name of Daniel Wise. As the legend goes, Old Man Wise was contracted by the Union Army to help bury the dead on his land after the Battle of South Mountain. The fighting at Fox's Gap was some of the fiercest of all the fighting that September day, and it lasted the longest. The combat at Fox's Gap started around 9 in the morning and lasted until well after dark. The combat started uh, between 3,000 Ohio troops under the command of General Jacob D. Cox and 1,000 North Carolinians under the command of Brigadier General Samuel Garland. Around about 10.30 in the morning, uh, Samuel Garland, a Confederate uh, general, was uh, mortally wounded on the field. At that point, of course, Confederate resistance started to dissolve and the Federals were able to push the Confederates through the gap and actually controlled the gap by around noon. They held their ground for almost two hours. Uh, and it was uh, one of the few instances in the war where there was actually hand-to-hand -hand combat. It, it, it got that fierce. Usually in the Civil War, when the, the two armies would come together, the, the sheer terror of, of the firepower, you know, the, the charges would just peter out before there was physical contact. But there was about a 15 to 20 minute period around mid-morning when it actually got to club muskets and, and bayonet wounds. It was during the fierce morning fighting that Confederate General Samuel Garland was mortally wounded and taken to the old South Mountain Inn, or as it was known then, the Mountain House. Eventually, the North Carolinians, for the most part, were driven down the west face of the mountain, and uh, Cox's Ohioans ha had actually won the crest. But now the, the Union Army was suffering under the misconception that the Confederates were a much larger force and there was a Johnny behind every tree. These tactics were enough to stall the Union Army to wait until reinforcements arrived to renew the fighting. What these rebels did, they called bushwhacking. They would hide behind a fence, jump up and shoot, duck down, run to another place, jump up and shoot, and they were all over Fox's Gap and it gave General Cox the impression that there was a much larger force. And so he decided that discretion was the better part of valor and he would wait for reinforcements. He pulled back, Anderson's men uh, continued their bushwhacking and, and sort of a law sets in around midday. Now, as the day progresses, more Union troops start showing up from the direction of Frederick. And we're talking about the Union Ninth Corps under the overall command of General Ambrose Burnside. The Corps commander is General Jesse Lee Reno. Troops of the Ninth Corps start showing up and start supporting Cox's position, getting ready for a general advance around 4 or 5 in the afternoon. On the Confederate side, uh, Longstreet's troops start arriving from Hagerstown. There's a bit of an irony with the Battle of South Mountain. Uh, many of the Union soldiers started their march some 12 miles to the east in Frederick, while many of the Confederates started their march that morning some 11 miles to the west from Hagerstown and they both meet on the mountain. The area around Wise's cabin was hotly contested. Uh, this part of the battlefield was fought over the entire day 
and uh, square foot for square foot, the fighting was just as intense here as you find on any other Civil War battlefield. Antietam, Gettysburg, it doesn't matter. Soldiers long after the war talked about how hot and intense the fighting was in this part of the field. Uh, the Wise's cabin became a feature. Uh, it was well defined, it was easy to see, so a lot of the troops referred to it in their after action reports and in their diaries and things like that. So the, uh, the, the fighting swirled around Wise's cabin throughout the entire day. As the Confederates tried to launch their counterattack, they used what was called the Sharpsburg Road at that time as a line to form up in. They started to move across Wise's south field uh, towards the Federals that were lined up along a stone line, a stone wall against the, uh, the south end of that field. Unbeknownst to them, of course, this was the remainder of the Ninth Corps that had managed to get, it up, get itself up on top of the mountain before they launched their attack. In the rush to get their men on the field, some Confederate troops wound up getting lost on the west face of the mountain. These lost troops were supposed to have been part of a larger contingent of Confederate troops that were supposed to be a grand movement that was to sweep the Federals from the mountain. As a result, only one regiment of troops from the Plan 3 entered the field of battle and ended up taking heavy casualties. One new regiment, the 17th Michigan, about 900 green troops fresh out uh, of Michigan, uh, less than two weeks, managed to get in a field behind Drayton's troops, come up behind them, and fire down into what is now the Reno Monument Road. Drayton's men take horrific casualties. One regiment uh, went in with 250 men and came out with 120. More than 50% casualties. And some of the bodies in the well, uh, in Wise's well at South Mountain, probably were Drayton's men. And you hear the exact same comments about that part of the road as you hear about Bloody Lane. Men's bodies stacked like cordwood. Uh, you could walk from one end of the road to the other without once touching the ground because of the large number of bodies that were stacked in there. Uh, because of that, of course, the 50 or 51st Georgia had to get out of the, the way they could. They had to run the gauntlet down the road and off the uh, west side of the mountain, uh, ending the fighting in that part of the field. So what exactly is the legend of Wise's Well? Here, in its entirety, is the 1992 presentation of the legend of Wise's Well. This is the monument that marks the spot where General Reno was killed during the Battle of South Mountain. The Battle of South Mountain was a bloody battle. Folks that had witnessed that said that it seemed like the side of the mountain ran red with blood. There were several generals killed during that battle. But after the battle was over, as darkness fell, the Confederates retreated under cover of darkness and marched over to Sharpsburg. Now the next morning when the sun came up and the Union generals looked over the battlefield, the Confederates were gone. They had retreated during the night. All they saw were the dead and dying just strewn all over the battlefield. Now as quickly as possible they took care of the wounded, but they didn't have time to bury the dead. But they realized if they left those bodies out there in the hot September sun, there might be a catastrophe. There might be an epidemic. So they decided that they would offer a dollar a body to all the local farmers to bury those dead Confederates. Now right here in this spot is Fox's Gap. This is where some of the worst fighting took place of the entire day. And just a stone's throw from here is the spot where Old Man Wise had his log cabin. Now that cabin was in horrible shape before the battle. But the morning after the battle, folks could not really believe that, that the cabin was still standing. It was so full of holes from cannons and shot and shell. Now that morning, as he strolled out and looked in his yard, he saw bodies everywhere. And he had heard about that offer of a dollar a body. And he looked out there and he thought, I'm going to make myself a heap of money. So old man Wise started out over the battlefield and started to drag those dead bodies, one by one, back to his house. And he had all these bodies laying there in his front yard. And he thought, boy, that's sure going to be an awful lot of digging to dig graves for all those dead rebels. And then he had an idea. 
Over there, he had a well, and that well wasn't much good. It was a dry well. And he thought to himself, I'm going to take those dead bodies, and I'm going to bury them all right, but I'm going to bury them in my old well. And that's what he did. He took 58 dead rebel soldiers, and he shoved, and he stuck, and he forced all of those in that dry well. And then when he was finished, he threw in a lot of soil, and he covered them up. Now, all the people around had heard about this, and they were up in arms. They said those dead rebels, they were, they were our enemies, but that's sacrilege. You don't stuff them in a well. That's not the proper burial. But old man Wise, he was tickled with himself. He thought, well, I'm going to go down to Boonesboro, and I'm going to buy myself a new tobacco pipe and some tobacco. And that's what he did. He walked down to Boonesboro, got himself some supplies, and about two weeks later, in the evening, he was sitting on his front stoop on an old cracker box. And he was puffing away on that pipe, just enjoying himself, thinking, boy, I made myself a heap of money. And all of a sudden, he saw a movement down the road. Who are you? I've come to have you turn me over, Mr. Wise. Who are you? I'm most uncomfortable lying on my face. Turn me over. Please turn me over. Please turn me over. Turn me over. Turn me over. And he climbed in that well with his spade, and he started to dig. And he was digging as fast as he could. Finally, the 13th soldier, that was the one. Well, then he started to, to dig, and sure enough, that soldier was resting on his head. No wonder he was uncomfortable. He very carefully got that soldier out, and he reburied him. So he worked through the night soldier after soldier burying each one and finally as the sun streaked through the morning sky he had that last soldier buried and he got down on his knees and he said a little prayer he said please please don't haunt me anymore thanks for watching be sure to like subscribe comment and share to keep fascinating content coming here at Nightmare Nexus.